ready for brain stories? Get inspired and learn from thought leaders, CEOs, business owners, managers, entrepreneurs, and experts who tell their brain stories and share their first-hand insights. Welcome to Brain Stock. I'm your host, Brigitte Bakowski. I support entrepreneurs and organizations to become future market leaders by transforming their ambitions and passion into an online brand that radiates beauty, brilliance, and authenticity, attracting the clients and recognition they deserve. Let's get started and dive with me into the world of brands. My guest today is Bridie Hollihan. Bridie, a trailblazer in the field of women's health, serves as the passionate founder and CEO of Female Health Founders. This visionary platform serves as an inclusive hub for empowering female entrepreneurs and innovators worldwide. With over 15 years of dedicated experience in product and business development management, Bridie has made indelible contributions to public health and women's wellness sectors. Her passion for innovation is evident in her utilization of cutting-edge methods such as gamification, hackathons, and patient advisory groups to drive transformative change. One of her proudest achievements to date is sponsoring Facebook UK's first-ever all-female hackathon. Through her leadership, Bridie strives to create an open access environment where game-changing ideas can flourish, ultimately increasing access to healthcare for women globally. Yeah, I warmly welcome Bridie Holyham. Welcome to Brent's Talk. <laughs> what an introduction. Thank you very much. Well, of course, you deserve oh. it. You have already oh. accomplished so much in your life. And I want to get right to the bottom. What inspired you to establish female health founders? Great question. Um, it kind of came out of identifying a huge gap in necessity. And like many kind of great entrepreneurs and people who start a business, they assume this thing, this product, this service already exists. They go to look for it. They realize it doesn't exist. They can't believe it doesn't exist because it's mm -hmm. so needed. And then they set about creating the thing um so that's kind of what happened for me throughout my career in the charity and academic sector I would work on some amazing phenomenal products and programs and projects and every time we would start completely from scratch finding the right app developers project managers marketers branding experts researchers everybody that saying of it takes a village, you know, it takes a village to create a new intervention. And I was just left kind of scratching my head that there wasn't a go-to platform for people who are developing businesses and innovations in the women's health sector. Yet there were platforms if you wanted to open a coffee shop and give you everything that you needed, or if you wanted to open a hairdresser's, um, or if you wanted to become a digital marketeer, there were all these platforms for these business industries, but there wasn't one for women's health. Mm. And I just thought this is such a missed opportunity. And also in women's health, the entrepreneurial sector are the people who are plugging the gender health gap around the world. These people are game changers for their communities. And yet there's nowhere to showcase or support or join up these amazing, amazing I call them gap game changers. I love a little slogan. And um, yeah, so it kind of got born out of, of identifying that as a need. Hmm. And that's that was a long answer. answer. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, I will dig deeper because there's so <laughs> okay. much uh, to talk about here. And it's a platform and you're also specializing in utilizing innovative methods such as okay. gamification, hackathons to drive trans transformative change, actually. So yeah. how, has, how have these methods contributed to the advancement of women's yeah. health initiatives then through your platform, through female health founders? Yeah, okay, so sort of so twofold there. These kind of, I call them like entrepreneurial tools, such mm -hmm. as hackathons mm -hmm. or 
focus groups or gamification. These are all what you would, you could kind of call grassroots tools. They're community and people first tools for developing change. And the majority of people working in women's health are pro community change and, and bringing the end user on board in the development phase. So all of these tools are amazing tools for women's health entrepreneurs to kind of have in their business toolkit. Mm -hmm. And then I myself use them. I'm a huge advocate, especially for Hackathon. I just think they're the most exciting, exciting way to answer a question mm -hmm. and, and not only answer the question, have some form of innovative output ready to go and test or launch at the end of it. It's the best bang for buck for time that you can use as an entrepreneur. How do you teach that in that platform? Because I'm quite sure a lot of women who are experts in their field are not familiar with these kind of tools. So how do you integrate that in your platform when you have your like weekly gatherings or is it like a one-on-one -on -one, uh, teaching on, on those or group teaching? Or how do you make sure that they really understand and then also are able to apply it? Yeah, I think. The first step is to make it not sound so scary. A yes. Hackathon it sounds like, what is going to go on? Yeah, is it, a, is it a marathon? What's going on here? Yeah. Well, it's a bit of a marathon, but, but it's less it's wet. Ex ex exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the first thing and, and one of the really key points that we try and do over at Female Health Founders is to remove the barriers to entry to these tools. Yeah. You know, just because it's called a hackathon or just because the knowledge is in a research journal or a policy paper doesn't mean it's not for women's health entrepreneurs. This yeah. stuff is for us because mm -hmm. they're the game changers, we're the game changers filling the gender health gap. So the first thing is to make it not, you know, accessible. Um, we have a blog article on how to do this on, on our website. Everything's open access. We greatly believe in not gatekeeping this information. Um, and basically, in a nutshell, a hackathon is a focus group, if you've ever mm -hmm. done market mm -hmm. research. Mm -hmm. It's a focus group, but with action and a few more sleeves mm -hmm. rolled up. And you could take a few different approaches. For example, the one we did at Facebook, we got different types of experts in the room. And I'm going to geek out for a second now. <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. something called the wisdom of the crowds theory or approach. So the greater mind theory is the great... The collective mind, sorry, is greater than one or two experts' minds to solve a problem. And so a hackathon basically works off this principle. So the more minds, the collective mind that you can have in a room to solve your problem, the greater the output, the innovation, the problem solved is, is going to be. So the, the, the first thing is just to ga gather the minds <laughs> yeah, and get, yeah. get them in the room. <laughs> it's, it's actually the first step in a design thinking approach. It's all about mm. brainstorming. It's really getting yeah. out of box and coming in with the weirdest yeah. ideas. Yeah. And then bring it all together again and, you know, yeah. think through all of these ideas. Then, okay, this is nothing we want to consider, but how yeah. this is something we want to go forward with. So you kind of prune it down. Exactly. And in a hackathon, you would prune it down, but also then build it. Yeah. So it's, it's, you would have then the expertise in the room, like user design, AI, depending on what the problem was that you're mm. looking to solve. Um, and also, it's a, so it's a great tool and method to use at the beginning stages of a business, of a women's health business, but also then... When you are going to market or you're going to scale or you're going to partnership, any of these transition points that happen throughout your business, this is a great tool to use mm -hmm. um, because you just don't want to sit in a room and make decisions yourself for a population like one mind versus thousands of minds never works. And that's the very old school traditional approach to women's health. Yeah. And <laughs> without getting on my soapbox about that. But but this is a phenomenal, amazing tool. I can't advocate for it enough. And it can be immensely cost effective. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Lots of people are just happy and excited to take part. If you feed people well, thank them well, you know, mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. are happy mm -hmm. to help. It's it's really amazing. 
Yeah. So it's all about collaboration, actually, exactly. uh, because it's bringing all this, these minds, these great minds together and to help yeah. each other yeah. in their effort of whatever that is. And yes. speaking of that and the women and effort, so this is a platform for, for women who want to bring about something, want to be innovative or are innovative, have a big vision. And where are they on their journey? Are those women, they are newly minted? Are they still on the fence and still uh, corporate or employees? Any and where all. are they? <laughs> Any at all. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that is yeah. also a beauty in one sense because everyone has a different perspective on things. So mm -hmm. it's more ideas coming to the table, isn't it? Yeah. And it's, so we specialize in SMEs, so small and medium-sized mm -hmm. enterprises. But, you know, a medium-sized enterprise is still up to 500 employees. Absolutely. Medium is still big in my yeah. mind. It's 10 plus, and, isn't it? Exactly. <laughs> so you have the micro and, and the medium. <laughs> yeah. So all up to 50 million turnover a year. Um, and But nobody is looking after the women's health entrepreneurs in the SME space, in the mm -hmm. women's health gap. So we are really unique in that way of, of serving this kind of almost neglected group of people who are working to fill the gap. Is it just UK-wide or are you talking about numbers worldwide? Worldwide. Okay. We're worldwide. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have, wow, amazing female health founders from Canada, Trinidad and Tobago, South Africa, Ireland, Scotland, France. It's... um. And they you're, all work together you're organically. You're truly global. Yeah. <laughs> truly global. It's truly global, yeah. <laughs> truly. And it's um, and and I think the reason why we we've been able to reach these people so quickly is mm -hmm. is that ironically there's a gap within the gap that <laughs> these people are not being given a platform, and not yeah. just even a platform, the right knowledge and advice specific to being an entrepreneur in women's health. And we are inclusive. So a female health founder can be a man or a co-gendered team or a woman. It can look like anything. And we're really trying to champion the inclusivity in the women's health space um, and, in, and be inclusive of all working in that because there's lots of men doing amazing women's health businesses but don't feel that there's a yeah. space for them exactly. unless they're big enterprise. Yeah, of course. So the men in the SME women's health world are like unicorns and I was trying to bring them into this collaborative space and fold too. Mm. So we are already talking about some limitations and why mm. women health founders is there to support and kind of, kind of fill the gaps and break, um, break up these limitations. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's talk about some common challenges in general other than you have already mentioned female founders face right now oh it's a good it's a good yeah. question because i mean there is yeah. a huge audience we are addressing right yeah. now and maybe they find themselves in there and say oh yes i have that challenge and yes um this is interesting yeah. i want to get in touch with Bridie yeah. on that <laughs> yeah well <laughs> It, it varies. So, for example, in Trinidad and Tobago, the female health founders there, they have an issue that there's no HRT available in Trinidad and Tobago. So then their version of the gap that they're working in is completely different in terms of what mm -hmm. they're trying to do and the needs that they have. So every country culture positioning presents different needs. Um, based on what's available to the women and what's accessible and what's not. Um, and then that in itself presents different entrepreneurial challenges because the menopause businesses, for example, in Trinidad and Tobago, aren't working to educate about HRT. They're working and, you know, their limitations are to only be able to educate and provide services around natural HRT because you can't get the pharmaceutical versions mm -hmm. um so it's a really interesting space to work within um but then it means that i was able to join them up with somebody who does work in the natural menopause space in canada who's already gone down the naturopathic menopause space and has done the work and the research and then now they're working together 
So this collaboration is is everything. And there's something beautiful about women's health. It's it's like you don't have to sell collaboration. It just is a default gear in the driving force of doing business. Yeah. That's that's just all we know. That's how we're making the world go round. You don't need to tell us the benefits of it. We know it already. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's a really lovely way to be able to help each other to scale in our in our different countries. Um a common barrier is that when they get to the point of wanting to go for investment, one, your this I heard this statistic the other day. You can please don't fact check it. I'm sure it's not 100 percent right, but you're more likely as a woman, regardless of what industry your business is in, to pitch for investment to a man named Dave or David <laughs> anywhere in the world than you are to a woman. Mm. And women invest in women. And so we're already up against a hurdle that that kind of like invests in like isn't available in the investment sit- like fields. So when these businesses are going for investment to go to the next level to increase their impact, the barriers are humongous for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and not only that, when it comes to investment, people want a minimum of 10 times return on investment. And sometimes you'll find five times, but it's quite rare. Um, And particularly when it's women's health, there's something about that they view that it's risky, even though it's 50% of the population of the world as a user, their their risk rating, their risk tolerance is much lower. And so they want a higher return on investment. Um, That's one of the reasons that has, has been stated. And so... These businesses are not making sometimes the ability to do five, ten times the better, but they can do five times. But what they say is, but actually, I can do five times impact as well as five times investment. We can reduce these rates of X, Y, and Z. We can increase these rates of access for X, Y, and Z. And when it comes to investment, nobody values the impact. It's about the financial return, not the community impact return. And so there's desperate need for a different type of funding for women's health. Um, For example, I went to the World Economic Forum talk um, last week on the, they state it as the $1 trillion gap Mm -hmm. in women's health. So they've crunched the figures and they say, basically, we could generate an extra trillion dollars a year if we close the gender health gap Mm -hmm. but to need that they've developed six outputs a bit like when we had the millennium development goals all those years ago and there were certain outputs that people would work towards so there's six outputs now six actions that we need as a world to work towards to close the gender health gap and one of them was different types of funding and different types of funding structures and from speaking with my, well, not my founders, the platform's founders, this this is so clearly needed. Mm-hmm. It was needed 50, 100 years ago, but it's needed now more than more than ever. So, yeah, but funding. <laughs> yeah, funding, funding. funding structures. But there, this is also very interesting what you mentioned, that there is the focus in, is on investment return. Mm. And not so much on community return, even yeah. though if the community return is higher, yeah. there would also be a higher investment return. And the focus is always on something that yeah. can be directly measured. Then yeah. community return, how do you measure that? Yeah. and But for an investor, that's not direct into their pocket. Exactly. That, that benefits their community. And so that direct train of investment coming back isn't there any so it's it's not it's not lucrative or appealing to yeah. them yeah wow uh it's still a long way to go i would say isn't it it is and it was interesting at the world economic forum talk mm-hmm. they were saying that actually if we did all these six things we can get there quicker but yet then it's not like countries sign up to say they're going to contribute towards these six things mm-hmm. they're just I'm sounding a bit sceptical, but they are just six things on a report that Mm -hmm. when you think of the grand scheme of the issue, 
it didn't even make mainstream news. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. A few a few blogs um have mentioned it in the kind of femtech women's health um sphere, um, but very specific places like the Gates Foundation, for example, Forbes mentioned it, but then it gets buried, doesn't mm-hmm. it? Mm-hmm. Within an hour of the other reports. But this needs a bigger call to action. Mm-hmm. Um, it needs country accountability. Um, and it also needs to acknowledge the SMEs who have been working in the gap. There's no acknowledgement of these SMEs. There, there, need, there needs yeah. to be more awareness and, and more mm-hmm. education out there when it uh, comes to that, isn't it? And also, like a thank you. Oh, yeah. I think countries need to thank these SMEs for plugging their gap. You know, these people work in this gap because the government or whoever in their country, the healthcare service, the policies have allowed these gaps to be in existence. Mm-hmm. And so these people have been doing the jobs of their countries. And, that, and the thing is, as women, we view the work of our community as ours too. And therefore, then these community products and programs and initiatives are created. But there is no support. Mm -hmm. There is no acknowledgement. There's not even a mapping of who they are or how many they are. Um, But then also in this gap, there is a huge mess to clean up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's greatness happening, but there's a mess. Yeah, um, what I'm <laughs> hearing right now, I don't know what the other five things are that are mentioned in this report. Maybe you can elaborate on that. But yeah. all these six things have been established as goals or achievements to mm-hmm. to go for, to strive for. Is this communicated to the small, medium enterprises, to the SMEs? I mean, they are trying hard, but they have their own vision, their own goals. Are these goals aligned. I think we need to start from there so they know what we are up for and how to align our goals we have as an organization, our vision, with that overall goals that are defined in that report. Yeah. I mean, that makes logical sense to me too. (laughs) (laughs) So Um, what's the problem here? Is it a communications (laughs) problem or what is it? It, I think it's an awareness. I mean, I, I think the work of the of this recent report is phenomenal. It's great progress. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. But like, it's a I'm report. Not... It's a report it's of statistics, statistics, right? So what do you do with it? This is the next exactly. consequence. So they, um, I'm just getting up the other five so I can say them correctly because I don't want to say them not correctly for mm-hmm. your audience. I have them written. Um, but... In answer to your question, no, um, nobody is communicating this to SMEs as part of the reason for. I knew this was an issue before this report came out last month. That's why we set it up. So when this report landed and one didn't even mention SMEs, didn't acknowledge them and didn't put them as part of the solution, then it just re-emphasized the importance for female health founders as a platform to advocate for SMEs in women's health. Um, Because even just taking the hackathon approach, imagine if you've got SMEs and pharma and policy and research and development in a room. Now let's let's create a change. Let's solve the problem like this. Whereas the report is based on data which is fantastic. But as we know in research, you could be quantitative, you could be qualitative, you can be mixed, but this is all quantitative, people reduced to numbers data. But you can't create a change or, or advice for change from that. The human element is missing. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, yeah, it's a step, but there needs, there needs to be more um, done the other, um, I'm just putting it out now for you. The other kind of, they call them actions rather than goals. So it was increased awareness of the women's health gaps. That mm-hmm. was one of the actions. So that's something that we do on our platform through yeah. founders' stories, news, um, enhance access to sex appropriate care. 
So there was lots of talk around myth busting that women's health is reproductive health. Hugely important to, you know, quite often it gets stuck that women's health is your fertility. But there's so much more. Like a, a woman presenting with um, a heart attack is 70% more likely to be disbelieved than the man. You know, all of women's health. <laughs> um, and then the sex appropriate care in terms of the gender terminology that we are using in the women's health space and about champion still being and championing the word women, but with whilst being inclusive at the same time. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the barriers to entry for marginalized communities is, is just getting bigger and bigger on top of the gap that's already getting bigger and bigger. Um, the third was to collect and analyze ethnicity, sex, gender specific data. So basically they need more data. Yeah. They need to understand what's going on more. Um, mm -hmm. And across middle, low and high income countries, obviously there is a leaning towards the middle and higher income countries um, in terms of data gathering, just because of infrastructure that exists. Exactly. Um, and then, but then, for, but even though that being said, for example, in the UK, 2% of research for public spending is on women's health. So even though we're deemed a, a rich country, 2% <laughs> of our whole research budget for public yeah, spending on health, 2%, the 50% of the population. So yeah, it's, it's always good to just sort of peel back the layers a little bit. Exactly. Um, yeah. And then increase funding and incentivize new financing models, as mm -hmm. we spoke about we spoke already, about that's hugely needed and one of the visions for female health founders is is to make good money so we can have our own investment fund. Exactly. We need wow. to keep this keep this going round. <laughs> yeah. um, and then the sixth part, the sixth action was to support policies that are based on evidence in women's health. But with, mm. but it's when you peel it back without the research, how do you have the evidence to inform the policy? Like what comes first? Where's the chicken and egg here? Mm. Um, yeah, it's an interesting report, but it doesn't now help to come up with a solution. And so now people need to get going. And uh, yeah. I'm so glad that you with your company are helping to fill this gap. But, but we're just still, but we're so tiny. Just, yeah. <laughs> the gap is so big. And I liken us to a solar system and we keep getting like each SME women's health business is another planet and another star and we're just our orbits getting bigger as more are coming coming in um and I just hope that our gravitas in time becomes mm. bigger so that we can help inform help be a seat at the table um we just need a seat nobody even knows the seat's missing right now <laughs> to even have the seat at the table yeah but I think you're doing your best and uh, I think also that sharing of what is going on in this industry on different platforms like on mine today is already the next big step because yeah. you're getting the word out, you're creating awareness and um, I hope it helps to make people think or change their perception or change their... Yeah. Just realizing that, that what Just the landscape exactly. is, like their knowledge of this, we need the yeah, that whole ignorance is bliss thing. It's well now we could the more people need to know, for them to then know how to take action. Yeah, yeah, and I think from knowing to taking action, there is an, it's, it's another big step. Yeah, so there is a lot of work going into then also motivating people to be part of that whole uh, movement. I think it's a movement. It's it's unique yeah. to get the masses on board in order to bring yeah. about a real change. Yeah, I love that what you're doing and bringing so much to the table in that industry. But I would like to switch gears a little bit and talk yeah. about <laughs> you and your brand. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm very curious. Why did you opt to brand female health founders in that specific colors and everything. So tell us a little bit about your branding story. Yes. So 
there's a really conscious process. I've had um, businesses in the past and I've worked obviously on women's health projects and programs for others. And there's quite a leaning towards, well, what do you like or what's trending at the moment? Yeah. And in the women's health space, that quite nine times out of 10 ends up being some shade of pink or red or peach. <laughs> this yeah. kind of spectrum. And I mean, I love these colors. I love them so much. And I could have easily defaulted to this branding. Um, but I wanted to make a conscious decision to one, be different, to stand out. And that's why I went for the sort of black, white and a hint of zesty green, I call it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was my thought. Why is she going for green? Because every color tells a story and uh, it's really, it's supporting the recognition of the brand, what it stands for. So, um, and the meaning that it brings across. So for me, that was kind of, okay, why is she doing that? So I want to know from you, why did you go for green? Well, it, it's energizing, it's, it's modern, and it, there's something fresh and new about it, which I really like that the energy that it sort of sits within. And there are other brands that are predominantly black with lots of white heavy spacing. And I've read lots of research around those brands, such as Forbes and Vogue. And I love how that balance of black and white creates that professional uh, Gates Foundation feel. do it too. Yeah, and, and it without saying anything other than we're here, we mean business and we're professional. Mm -hmm. without even having to say it. And I think branding is amazing that it can say something without saying it. Exactly, yeah. With, <laughs> but with I, colors you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, but I knew that we needed a hint of something, a zest of something that would make us different, mm -hmm. that we can use as an accent in places and in logos. Um, I'm not going to be rocking up in a green hoodie anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> branding. <laughs> um, but... But it needed something like that. And there were other brands like, I love Grazia. I think they're beautiful. I think they're amazing. And how they've done a hint of zesty lemon in their branding just to weave it through and give it that pop. And I was, I was really inspired by big media companies such, mm -hmm. as, such as Grazia, Channel 4, have um, done it BuzzFeed. Not BuzzFeed. That's the other one. Oh, gosh. Vice. <laughs> Okay. So heavy, heavy black with a zest little pop of colour and, and I think it works very well and it's where I wanted to position myself. Mm. Um, since we're talking about our other companies that you see kind yeah. of, okay, these are role models for giving yeah. a specific zest. Are there mm. any other examples of inclusive women's health brands that you want to mm. talk about? Mm. Yes. So there's it's injured. there's one who is pink and red and I think they've done it beautifully. So they have advocated, I feel, and positioned themselves as an inclusive pink women's health brand. And I think they've done it phenomenally well and that's Peanut App. I just think they're amazing. <laughs> I think everything that they have done to be a women's health brand, to be pink in the women's health space but be inclusive and accountable and transparent and advocate for change is amazing because pink brands in women's health the whole pink washing of women's health yes is, no <laughs> is is saturated yeah and peanut app have really done well to position themselves in this saturated heavy space that can be sort of the pink can be used and abused to say it's women's health when it's not. And so I, I, I think they're phenomenal. Yeah. They've done yeah. With it. So we, you have used pink and pink washing, and it's also mm. part of our title beyond pink. Mm. Um, for the audience that has never heard about pink washing, but knows about green washing, for example, <laughs> yeah. what is pink washing? What are you addressing here exactly? Yeah. So it started, but I'm going to give a lecture now. Sorry. Yes. No, I love that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I love so, a masterclass. <laughs> with, um, 
it started like all good things in women's health start with a woman who saw a need for change for something mm. and her name was Charlotte Healy so in 1991 so early 90s sadly her mother grandmother and daughter all battled from breast cancer and I can't imagine what she would have gone through the heartbreak of that and she turned to look to local and national breast cancer charities and she saw that the breast cancer charity was only don donating 5% of its 1.8 billion annual turnover to research and development for reducing breast cancer. But then they were the breast cancer charity, 5%. Mm -hmm. And so the pink ribbons that you see people wearing... Um, and now we have them, you know, we have yellow for endometriosis, purple for PCOS. We have many for different things in women's health. Um, but the pink ribbon is kind of the original women's health charity ribbon. But it started off not as something that you would wear, but she pinned them to postcards. And so she would send these with a note to people in power to say, hey, <laughs> This charity's got all this money and only putting 5% into tackling what it says its whole mission is about. Mm. There's something wrong here. Um, and so she'd send them to these people in power to advocate for accountability, really, and, and for money to be spent better. Mm. Um, but what happened was, like all commercialization of women's health, is big companies wanted to sponsor her in what she was doing and she was adamant to no sponsorship. No, yeah. this is about holding people account. This is not about making money. This is not about co-branding awareness. Nobody's riding on each other's coattails here. This is purely about this. Yeah. Um, and then they ignored her, basically, later on down the line. And, you know, we've all seen the pink ribbon everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. Car yeah. dealers in October, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Car dealerships having pink ribbons on their cars saying, if you buy this new car, we're going to donate 3% to cancer. Breast Cancer Charity, Estee Lauder, famously set up one of the first breast cancer research and development institutes. Phenomenal mm -hmm. work, mm -hmm. taking away mm -hmm. from that at all. But then as the company evolved, and the pink ribbon then became a pink product line. And then that pink product line was all about raising awareness and apparently money back into the research and development of their own institute. Um, and that came under a lot of criticism. Of course. A lot of criticism. Yeah. But you, you see this happening now. So in my PhD research, I saw this happening in endometriosis mm. and the yellow ribbon. And you could almost call it yellow washing. Yeah. So yeah. It, the, sa it's the, same, the same principle applies. And, you know, you can go on Etsy, you can type in endometriosis, and you will see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of products that have been developed to raise awareness for endometriosis that are all got yellow ribbons on. You can buy badges. You can buy things that pop into your Crocs. You could buy T-shirts and totes and... yeah. And apparently X percent goes towards whether it's the Endometriosis Society of America or whichever charity they choose. But there's no accountability. There's there's no transparency. There's there's nothing. Yeah. So how can someone, an individual, make sure not to fall into this trap of um, purchasing something that is from a company that is actually pink washing or yellow washing or green washing but in our case let's say pink washing is it doing yeah. our own research is yeah. it going with our inner gut i don't believe or or i believe or whatever so what would you do what kind of advice would you give yeah i would sadly this is the only time i would say don't go with your gut because these marketeers are phenomenal. Yeah. They are well trained to override your gut feeling. And so I know in America, there is a, a bit like a charity trust pilot where people can leave reviews about mm -hmm. how well this charity is. Um, we don't have that in the UK. I'm not sure about Canada mm -hmm. or other places mm -hmm. in the world, mm -hmm. but 
I'd seek out mm-hmm. that relevant one in your in your country. Um, when it comes to individuals, SMEs, influencers are working in this space with their own product development. It, you know, yeah, there's thousands of influencers yeah. doing pink washing. Um, I mean, ask them. Lots, not lot, not enough actually share screenshots of the transactions made of the donations to the charity Hmm. I think you shouldn't have to ask for that it should be just front and center of somebody's of somebody's business um and if you can't easily find you know that the proof is in the pudding kind of the donations have happened Hmm. if it's not Hmm. front and center if it's not on the about page or in the screenshots, in their Instagram stories or whatever, wherever it may be. If it's not easy to find, I would question it. Yeah. And it, it's, you shouldn't have to ask. Yeah. Great advice. Thank you so much, Bridie. That's okay. Wonderful. I could go on and on and on and on, but I think we should come to an end because yeah. that's already a lot of information. Thank you yeah. so much for that. Um, it was great. I would like to conclude with a word wrap. So I have some words for you and I hope you can just answer top of mind whatever comes up. All right. Are you ready? (laughs) Good. What do you think when you hear wellness? Instagram. Oh, why? So I have to ask. (laughs) Why Instagram and wellness? (laughs) For me, stress. (laughs) I just think Instagram is where wellness lived. Okay. Wellness business lived. Yeah. Okay, that's what I, I understand that's, your yeah, association really. now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, 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 no. That's, that's why what I like so much about this word wraps because you have completely different pictures in yeah. mind and meanings attached to it um, because of where you're coming from, your profession and your industry. And so that's, that's just interesting. <laughs> So the, walk, social media brain. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the second one, inclusion. Um, not enough is the word that comes to mind. Not enough yeah. at all. Yeah. Green. Green. <laughs> yes. Female health founders. <laughs> Entrepreneurship. Oh, the most, oh, one word, sorry. Um, no, no, no. You can also come up with a sentence. Um, the most exciting, awesome people in the world. Oh, yeah. Community. Oh, also, not enough. Not enough. Then it's not be enough, more, right? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's the golden ticket. Okay. And what does yeah. a brand mean to you? It's, it's, the pers- it's a personality. It's what the difference between business being dead or alive in my mind. It's a personality, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I've never heard that, but oh, I like it. <laughs> There's okay. a lot to say about that. All right, Bridie, if someone wants to join your community, wants to get yeah. in touch with you, wants to learn more about you, wants to be part of this network where entrepreneurs lift each other, help each other yeah. innovate. So uh, where do they find you? Come on over. Come on over there. <laughs> Come on over. So you can find everything on femalehealthfounders.com. Um, we have a free membership for founders. It will always be free for founders where they can share their women's health business story. They can read strategies for success from other founders. You know, we've got a support group. All the usual bits and more mm-hmm. are there. And so that's where I say, come on over, meet everybody, collaborate, be inspired. And most importantly, share your story, Mm -hmm. claim your piece of the platform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, Bridie, also thank you for this wonderful conversation, for being my guest today here on Brands Talk and sharing your idea, your vision, your passion. Uh, and everything that you are and what you're doing and bringing to the table. Thank you so much. No, oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> if you like my show, follow Brands Talk on your preferred app. 
share it on social media and if you find a minute or two, leave a quick rating or review. Thank you so much. If you want me to guide you to become a future market leader by transforming your ambitions and passion into an online brand that radiates beauty, brilliance and authenticity, attracting the clients and recognition you deserve, drop me an email. I'd love to be your guide on your hero journey. Check out my website, BridgetBrands.com. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I hope you will stay tuned in on the next episode when we dive into the world of brains.